So identifying the second power. Who's that second power? Okay. <laughs> Who is it? Who, who's that Pokemon, guys? Who's that Pokemon, guys? Really, what we're what we're about to see is that there were many candidates uh, for the identity of the second power, and you're going to be amazed at the spectrum of the different people that Jews kind of put in that seat, right? Um, and it's important because really what they're doing is they're looking at scripture and there's these figures that are very obviously divine starting even in the book of Genesis, right? Um, where the angel of the Lord is called God uh, by Hagar. Uh, he's called God by, you know, the word of the God is, is called God by Abraham, right? Um, we see the angel of the Lord identifying himself as the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Exodus, right? So there's this figure that is um, humanish, right? Uh, has a form, uh, is able to eat food, things like this. And yet, um, who's this, who's this, who's this figure, right? Who, who is this ancient power? And then especially when you get to the two power stuff, it's interesting. This idea, like what, what, Heiser concludes here is these speculations were not considered unorthodox. Um, yes. The idea is evil entered the world and we need someone to eradicate that evil. Mm -hmm. And God is going to send someone from the seed of Eve to crush the head of Satan at some point and bring paradise back to mankind. And so they were looking because God said he's going to do this, right? Wouldn't you? Um, right. And so it's not unorthodox for them to reflect on this and think about it. And I don't know if this take is right or not, but even the disciples were saying, you know, are, are you the one? You know, and some people thinking John the Baptist might be this messianic figure even. Mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of, to me, in the same vein of, looking for this second power figure who's going to eradicate the evils of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very good. So uh, so the theories behind the identity of the second power have ranged from Moses to Enoch, later identified in uh, rabbinic literature as the Metatron, right? So um, uh, retro-Orthodox threw up the name Metatron up here. Um, that's David. And Enoch uh, later becomes the Metatron, and we'll, we'll look at that as well, uh, eventually. Um, then we actually have Satan himself as a second power, and we will discuss, and then also Adam, uh, some of which we can we can cover now, we're going to go over that, and others which will be discussed uh, greater in future installments, right? So stick around. This is going to be a very interesting uh, thing, and we're going to try to keep up the quality. So this is uh, William Blake. Uh, William Blake's uh, Ancient of Days um, image. I like it. So, so the most explicit first depiction of these two powers, right? You do see in the Old Testament, the angels of the Lord identified as God, right? Um, you do see this word of the Lord figure appearing to Abraham. And we do see, you know, uh, statements from uh, God saying, no man can see my face and live. And you're like, well, like, why, you know, why is it that we have this other uh, angel out here calling himself God, the people can see and they don't die. And then you've got this other figure that, you know, or other statements where God says, no man can see my face and live. Right. Um, and so we're going to kind of discuss that. But uh, ultimately, though, in Daniel chapter seven is the first time that we see both of these figures at the same time in the same place. Right. And that's important. So, Cornell, once you, uh, once you, I guess, maybe read this or whatever. I beheld until the thrones were set and the ancient of days sat and his raiment was white as snow and the hair of his head as pure wool. His throne was a flame of fire and his wheels burning fire. A stream of fire rushed forth before him. Thousand thousands ministered to him and ten thousands of myriads attended upon him. The judgment sat and the books were opened. I beheld in the night vision and lo, one coming with the clouds of heaven as the son of man. And he came unto the ancient of days and was brought near to him. And to him was given the dominion and the honor and the kingdom, and all nations, tribes, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. Okay. So, 
we've got these two divine persons, right? We've got Ancient of Days sitting on a throne, right? And then we see him calling forward, the Son of Man. The Son of Man comes riding in on the clouds, right? Um, I think you have a scripture reference here. Uh, we'll, we'll get to it, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's Psalms. in the Psalms. 103, yeah. 104. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. So there, there's these imagery, right? As we talked about this, this idea of gradually over time more and more attributes move from the first power to the second power right um and so uh from the from the first power to the second power ancient of days to the son of man right exactly and the first one seems to be that he's riding on a cloud right that's the first one that seems to be the other thing is that everybody um worships him right uh to him was given the dominion the honor the kingdom and all nations tribes and languages shall serve him right so i think that's you know great um, <laughs> um so uh but here we go so notice there's a few things in the text first there's a processional order okay so first we see the ancient of days and then we see the son of man Right. And so what they're doing is they're kind of establishing hierarchy or rank or whatever it is that you might want to call that. But you see this like uh, procession, first the Ancient of Days, then the second power. And that's going to be a common motif uh, going forward. OK, um, and this is consistent with what is called the Orthodox doctrine of the monarchy of the father. Right. So orthodoxy has a way of identifying the one God as the father and not just some divine nature or whatever that the Western um, church has taken on. Um, and if you want to learn more about the monarchy of the father, you can see this video by Dr. Bill Branson. We're going to show you the first 50 minutes of it. If you guys can't hear it, you please tell me in the comments. Okay. Would you say if someone in the old Testament, whether it was a prophet or a character in the old Testament that saw God, that was the theophany of Christ. Is that is that the orthodox position? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it took me a long time. I mean, even after I became orthodox, like it took a long time for me for that to click because I grew up with this idea that the Old Testament is all about God the Father. And then all of a sudden in the New Testament, it's like, hey, here's this guy. He's just been hanging out playing Xbox in the back or, you know, the son of God here. You like, just where did that come from? And, you know, there was, there was some prophecies about the Messiah, but like, where did, you know, and why is he divine? Uh, you know, it's just kind of tradition or something. If that's the view that you have, I mean, I think it does make, it, it does raise a lot of questions about the Trinity. Blessed are you. Okay. So Dr. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're not watching 50 minutes of it. Just the first 50 seconds. If you guys are interested in that, okay, I highly recommend um, you uh, checking it out sometime, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the link to it uh, in the chat. There you go. So, Bo Branson, he, he did his doctoral thesis on the monarchical Eastern view of the Doctrine of the Trinity. There's more than one model. I think the Eastern... Eastern version does better. Go ahead. He's he's really um, in his dissertation. He's actually addressing um, Unitarians and the uh, Dale Tuggy because um, Dale Tuggy is becoming a pretty popular Unitarian right now, yeah. um, and and he's just kind of ripping apart this more social understanding of the Trinity um, right. as distinctly that. And and one thing to mention real quick is that. There are <laughs> multiple ways to understand the word God. And I think mm -hmm. this is what one thing that Bro Branson does a good job of. He's going to say, look, when we say the word God, there, there's going to be the definition of one source, right? Which there's one principle, right? One, one source of all things, and that is the Father. Mm -hmm. And of course, we believe in the eternal procession outside time and space, right? But there's also this understanding that you are gods, like when Jesus says that to everybody, you are gods. And like Athanasius says, God became man so that we might become God as on taking on the divine nature. So this participation aspect of becoming God. Um, and furthermore, there's the functional aspect of God because the sons of God, 
um, are going to be like the the um, the rulers over the nations. So if you been watching anything we've been doing, uh, we've talked about Deuteronomy, how the nations got split up into 70 and they were assigned gods. Michael is assigned to Israel and he is sort of the ruler over Israel, right, to help them. And so there is this governing aspect to um, the word God. So there's mm -hmm. there's a source. There's this uh, divine nature aspect of participation, and then there's this functional aspect of governing uh, as mm -hmm. a way of saying that you're a god. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to be careful on, well, in what way, what do we mean when we say the word god in each particular context? Okay? Yeah. Absolutely. So out there. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Jeff R. has got a question. Sorry if this is a dumb question. It, it's not. Um, is Unitarian the same as modalist? So Unitarian is not modalist. Uh, it's, I guess you could, some people would argue that, you know, modalism is a form of Unitarianism. Unitarianism is the belief that there's only, you know, one power, right? We're going to use that term. There's only one power. Um, and um, so Jesus is not God. He's not, he's not divine. Some will say he's an elephant. Lord have mercy with my hiccups. Like he's a, he's um, a savior though. You know, right. He's a savior. Right. But he's not actually God. Um, modalism, which is I, I, I grew up in a modalist uh, sect, um, is this idea that the father becomes the son. Right. Um, or that the Holy Ghost and the father are exactly the same. There's no distinction. It's just it's just a term of uh, uh, water, functional, ice. you know, water, ice, you know, vapor, things like this. Um, people have said really the idea uh, in modalism is that God, the father became a man in Jesus Christ. So the good thing about modalists is that they, um, they believe that Jesus is God, right? Uh, bad thing about modalism. Uh, I, I don't think it does. It doesn't do justice, justice to the fullness of the biblical revelation of God. Right. Um, so hopefully that uh, answers your questions. Uh, Jehovah's witnesses would certainly be considered uh, Unitarian, um, you know, so yeah. Uh, Hebrew doesn't say face, it says faces, as in you have our faces. God has not a face, but or faces that was relevant somewhere in there. Yeah, so uh, what he's what he's pointing out is that the word uh, for presence or face is panin, which is a plural word, right? The I am ending is a plural word. So, uh, good job, Napoleon, uh, bony sharts, <laughs> <laughs> like Elohim. Right. Elohim, right? Elohim is a plural word, right? So, um, and that's, that's good. So, so, um, uh, secondly, notice the, okay. Um, uh, okay. So there's that. Okay. So secondly, notice, uh, in the Daniel seven text, uh, the divine descriptions of the ancient of days, particularly when there's thrones, there's fire, you know what I mean? Um, you got the Son of Man coming in on the cloud and, and all this stuff, right? And then thirdly, it may be worth noting that the fire rushes forth from the throne of the Ancient of Days, right? So you've got this stream of fire coming out of the Ancient of Days' thrones. Uh, do, uh, Father Dr. Stephen Slaris, who was my priest when I uh, first became Orthodox, believed that this is a reference to the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit that is coming from the uh, the, the, the fire is coming forth from the throne is reference to the Holy Ghost. Uh, and also notice that the fire proceeds from the throne of David, uh, the throne of the ancient of days alone, right? Which uh, he, he takes to mean is, uh, you know, evidence against the filioque. I don't want to get into that conversation right now, but, um, and as we mentioned before, there were three powers traditions as well, as described in the book, three powers in heaven, which was recently published, um, you know, which we, indicated upwards okay so um so concerning the visual and auditory theophanic modes uh andre orlov writes this uh merrill willis noted that as the deity bestows on the human like one right the one like the son of man human like one uh dominion and glory divine prerogatives becomes visible the human like one brings to full visibility in the sight of the nations the glory of the most high this insightful comment accentuates one of the essential features of the joint theophanies. When the, quote, visibility of the deity is gradually transferred to the second power, who will eventually become the image of the invisible God. Of course, at the starting point of this important conceptual trajectory is Daniel 7. The deity is still far away from being invisible, right? So in other words, in Daniel 7, you see both. Ancient of days and, 
you know, the son of man, right? You see both powers, but eventually again, that image is of the, of the first power is going to recede. He's going to be an auditory expression, booming voice in heaven type thing. Right. Um, and then also lastly, the one who rides on the cloud for cloud for Israel was reserved uh, solely for Yahweh. Other religions has Zeus and Baal riding on the clouds. And we see this in the Psalter. Oh, Yahweh, my God, you are very great. You clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. You who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a tent curtain, the one who sets beams in the waters for his upper chambers, who makes clouds his chariots, who rides on the wings of the wind, who makes his messengers the winds, his attendants a flame of fire. Um, the, this There's a couple of things. I, actually, I probably should have highlighted this. But, um, but yeah, we have this imagery of... God riding on the on the clouds. There's more than just this. Good afternoon, Brother Philip. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Join his YouTube channel and support this man. He's awesome. Um, he's planting a church uh, and producing all of the equipment for his church um, out there. Uh, he made his own iconostas and everything. It's beautiful. St. Zinnias Chapel. Everyone pray for St. Z- uh, J- uh, Zinnias Chapel and the church that, uh, that they're planting in Maine. So, uh, that all being said, um, this other thing, this uh, attendance of flame of fire, this is going to become relevant later. So keep in your mind this idea, this uh, the the idea of of God's angels being associated with fire. Uh, we could also remember, right, the, the angel of the Lord appearing in the burning bush, right? Things like that. Remember this concept. It's going to become relevant later. Um, Okay, so AI made this image and it is dope. Okay, <laughs> just look at it. So this is the exagoge of Ezekiel, the tragedian, the exaltation of Moses. Okay, and um, this is so unique. You know, Cornell, why don't you why don't you take this one? Um, you know, we talk about the picture. I mean, you got the the, the way we're uh, interpreting is this is Moses on the throne with mm-hmm. his rod, and then here we have Moses below. Um, parting the seas, the Red Sea, like he's going through. Um, and mm-hmm. then, of course, you got the clouds as his uh, chariot. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's an awesome picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also, though, what's happening here is we have Moses above and below at the same time. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's that's imperative, right? Yeah, um, this, this because... dream, his vision, yeah. Right, this is a vision. Uh, so this is the exog- uh, exagoge um, uh, by Ezekiel the tragedy, and this is not Ezekiel the prophet. This is a writer, and he uh, basically takes the book of Exodus and, pr- and makes it into a play, right? Um, and it's got dialogue. He goes back and forth. It's really, really neat. Um, and m- basically, it's a retelling of Exodus, but it's got this interesting uh, sequence here that's unique. And then there's also a bit about a Phoenix at the end that's unique as well. Not part of the Exodus narrative, but this is really cool. So go ahead. Again, just to recast things, this is again, showing examples of a figure becoming a second power, like a human becoming a second power or what have you. That, that, that is the idea. And so what Andre Orlov right now is doing is saying, here's an example. Here's an example, right? Mm-hmm. So so we'll just kind of go through this and show the first example being Daniel, right? The son of man in the ancient of days, okay? And then here's uh, one where we have um, Moses. So I'll just read this, this section here that I think is really the, the most important part of the tragedy in here. So... Mm-hmm. I had a vision of a great throne on the top of Mount Sinai, and it reached to the folds of heaven. A noble man was sitting on it. Again, this is a vision Moses is having. It's like a dream, and he's telling um, his colleague about it. And he says, with a crown and a large scepter in his left hand, he beckoned to me with his right hand. So I approached and stood before the throne. He gave me the scepter and instructed me to sit on the great throne. Then he gave me the royal crown and got up from the throne. I behold, beheld the whole earth all around and saw beneath the earth and above the heavens. A multitude of stars fell before my knees, and I counted them all. They paraded past me like a battalion of men. Then I woke from my sleep in fear. Um, 
really interesting story. Again, we see um, this figure like like the Ancient of Days on his throne beckoning Moses to come forward and start taking on these divine attributes, these divine functions, scepter, throne, royal crown, um, and then also this idea of the stars falling before him, right? And the stars um, definitely are pointing to angels. Angels. Yeah. Angels are worshiping him, okay? That's really important um, <laughs> to understand that he is made above the angels, and the angels are now worshiping him, okay? Mm -hmm. um, what else do we got here, Justin, if we scroll down? Yeah, well, I want to I want to point out one other thing, which yeah. is um, this this is also a motif of you know the 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 prophet or the seer, right? As um, uh, Andre Orlov likes to use the term seer, the seer sees a vision of a divine being, and then it is revealed to the seer that he is the divine being, right? And this is something that will show up later um, as well. So it's like him seeing himself as a divine being. This is why he wakes up and he's like terrified. Like, what did I just dream? Right? Like, what? so it's very, it's, it's very interesting. So this is kind of the exaltation of Moses. Um, and we'll, we'll keep. And, and uh, one, one other thing um, I want to point out, I guess, um, this dream is very much like the dream of Joseph. Right? Right. And he has this dream of his brothers bowing down before him. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, his brothers are envious. Yeah. Very mad. Very upset about this. I don't like this idea that I'm going to worship him or bow down before him. No, thanks. And um, that will also come in later. <laughs> and also, Moses is a very interesting figure because he is establishing that first covenant. And we see his life, the way it's played out, is parallel to Christ's own life, you know, Christ being taken out of Egypt and then leading Israel in the wilderness, Jesus fast for 40 days after his baptism, his exodus experience. I mean, the parallels between Jesus and Moses is um, striking Yeah, mm -hmm. all the way through the whole life of Moses and the whole life of Jesus. We can find um, parallels. So um, Moses is a type of Christ. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to point that out. Yeah, absolutely. And then also, I think it's maybe worth noting that this uh, vision in the context of the story is when Abraham, not Abraham, when Moses is going up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, right? So this vision is almost like he is both the receiver of the Ten Commandments and the giver of the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, very, very interesting, very surreal stuff. So uh, then we have the Book of the Similitudes, right? So uh, the book of the sim uh, similitudes is in Ethiopian Enoch. I don't own Ethiopian Enoch. I only have the Greek version. And so the Greek version is a lot smaller than the Ethiopian version. So this is why it's titled the book of the, of the similitudes. This is Enoch ascending into heaven. Um, also another J uh, AI generated image. So uh, we see here and, My and Michael and Raphael and Gabriel and Phanuel. Raphael appears in the book of Tobit, so he is a canonical angel in the Orthodox Church. So, and Michael and Raphael and Gabriel and Phanuel and many holy angels without number came out from that house and with them the head of days. Now, the reason why this phrase head of days appears, why head of days, why not ancient of days? Um, the word for head and for ancient in Greek is arche, right? So the Ethiopians translated that word RK as head of days, um, but the underlying Greek word would have been the same, uh, RK of days, the, the ancient of days. So and with them, the head of days, his head white and pure like wool. We've seen this already in Daniel chapter seven and his garments indescribable. And I fell upon my face and my whole body melted and my spirit was transformed. And I cried out in a loud voice in the pow in the spirit of power. And I blessed and praised and exalted. And these blessings which came out from my mouth were pleasing before the head of days. And the head of days came with Michael and Gabriel, Fanuel, Raphael and Fanuel, and thousands and ten thousands of angels without number. 
And he, that angel, came to me and greeted me with his voice and said to me, You are the Son of Man who is born to righteousness, and righteousness remains over you, and the righteousness of the head of days will not leave you. Okay, so it's important to keep in mind in Enoch, right? This is we're not we're not showing you the whole image. In Enoch, Enoch has visions of the Son of Man. Okay, he has visions of the Son of Man. And here in this part, it's revealed that he is the Son of Man. Okay. Um, now this is only this only appears in the Ethiopic uh, version, but um that's it, that's interesting because it, it kind of goes back with this exegoge of Moses, um, or exegoge of Ezekiel, the the uh what do you call it, the uh elevation of Moses or whatever. Um here again, Enoch, who sees the Son of Man, the vision of the Son of Man, is revealed to be the Son of Man. And also you see this transformation. Right, this is a glorification. My whole body melted. Right, my spirit was transformed. I cried out in a loud voice in the spirit of power. Right, uh, something dramatic. It almost reminds me of Werewolf. You know, like that transformation in that Michael Jackson uh, video. It's like, right? meta, it's like a metamorphosis. You know, it's a metamorphosis. It looks yeah. painful. Right. <laughs> um. And so that's, you know, that's cool. And I would just say the one, one other thing. Um, he greeted me with his voice. You are the son of man. Um, yeah. This idea of going back to this oracular centric, right? This, this vocal um, invisible figure now. And it seems as though he's taking on the uh, visible expression of this um, invisible God. Right. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And should also, which we're not going to get into a bunch here because we're going to go talk about this later, mm -hmm. but when we read New Testament passages like transfiguration, baptism, we'll see voice and all that stuff like show great continuity. But I don't want to get into that right now, but we should be keeping that in our forefronts as, as Christians anyways, right? That this is right. going to be happening. So absolutely.